thank you all very much for coming out today and for helping me look good on camera. I appreciate it. As Brian said, my name is Zoe Bedell, and I served in the Marine Corps for four years before I came to Harvard. I did two deployments in Afghanistan during that time. I loved my time in the Marine Corps. I had a fantastic Marines, I learned a lot, and I have a tremendous respect for the organization. But the fact is that the military is one of the last places in American society where gender discrimination is institutionalized, meaning it's an official part of government policy. So today, I'd like to help you understand what that means, what the policy is, and what the practical effect of that policy is on women who are trying to serve their country. I'm also going to talk about my lawsuit, where we're challenging the constitutionality of this policy and asking to have it declared unconstitutional so that women have the opportunity to serve based on their abilities and are not excluded simply because of their gender. And then finally, I'd like to share some lessons that I've learned with you as I have gone through this process. So first, what is the policy? As it stands, women are not allowed to serve in direct ground combat units or units who co-locate with those. All right, so what does that mean? I want you to think about any military movie you've probably ever seen. It's men and they're fighting. These are infantry marines, they're on the ground. It's artillery, it's tanks, it's the people who are engaged in closing with and destroying the enemy. It's the mission of the military and these jobs are closed to women. Now, I guess the thinking is something that, whether it's for physical reasons or mental reasons or emotional reasons, maybe women aren't just good enough to do it. They're just not capable of serving in these jobs. Okay, so let me bring it back down to reality here, and let me tell you what I did in the military. I was in charge of a program called the Female Engagement Team. I had 47 female Marines <coughs> who were responsible for going out into Afghan communities, engaging with the men and women, learning about their communities, learning about their concerns, and bringing that information back and helping the infantry commanders that we were supporting. My Marines broke down into teams of two, and they were usually the only two women assigned to these infantry units. And as the officer in charge of this program, it was my job to make sure that they were trained and make sure they had the support and resources they needed to do their jobs. So we were contributing the security mission, we were building relationships, we were working really across the spectrum. And as I mentioned, we were living and working with infantry units. That means that when the units went on patrol into the villages, if we wanted to talk to Afghans, and that was our job, we went on patrol into the villages. If you're going on patrol, everyone's wearing the same gear, everyone's carrying the same rifle, and let me assure you that if someone starts shooting, we're shooting back, regardless of what the policy says, because that's what Marines do, and we are Marines. All right, so there's a very clear disconnect, right? The policy is saying that this isn't happening. Women aren't in combat. They're in safer zones. They're in safe jobs that are just providing support. But I know for a fact that my Marines were in combat, that they were in firefights, despite what the policy was trying to say. So that's an obvious problem with the policy. But I want to help people understand some of the second order effects as well. The organization is ultimately saying that it's OK to treat this group of people as second-class citizens. And when an organization says that, it makes it okay for people who want to to treat them as second-class citizens across the spectrum. So not just when they're in a situation where they might be in combat, but when they're just trying to do their normal jobs, when they're just going about their daily lives. So for example, when I went to a meeting, I was a subject matter expert on a female engagement team. No one knew this better than I did. I was good at my job. But when I walked into the room, it was just as acceptable in that culture for people to talk about my figure as it was for them to talk about my competency and my professionalism. That didn't go well, right? That didn't make me happy. And it was frustrating to see that in my own life, but where it really made me angry was when I saw that from my Marines. As I said, it was my job to support them. It was my job to make sure they were able to get their jobs done. But there was this bar that was in the way that kept them from ever being equal, and there was nothing I could do to help remove that bar for them. That's why when the ACLU approached me about joining a lawsuit to challenge this policy, I jumped to the chance, because that actually was the opportunity to remove this bar. As I said, the policy is seeking to have the, um, I'm sorry, the lawsuit is seeking to have the policy declared unconstitutional, and we've had some initial success not in the courts per se, but shortly after we filed, the Secretary of Defense actually repealed the policy. 
It was not simply because of the lawsuit. The lawsuit was a sharp poke. It's an outside way for people to understand that you're going to get called into the public forum to account for this policy. And people who are thinking, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't accord with the 10 years plus that we've had women serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's an extra little push to help them take action to fix that wrong. It also gives us a, an opportunity, as the, as the um, rollback of the policy continues, to continue to apply outside pressure. So I said the policy was repealed, that's what we were looking for. You guys are probably thinking, why are you even here? What are you talking about? Isn't it done? No, even though the policy is gone, the, the actual um, on the ground policy still remains. So women still aren't allowed to serve. They aren't even allowed to try. So we're holding the military accountable for that and saying it's not gonna be okay to drag your feet. You're not gonna be able to just close these units and keep them closed without someone answering, uh, someone asking you what you're doing and someone holding you accountable for that decision. Finally, it's given me a chance to speak publicly about my experiences in the military. Whether it's on CNN or at TEDx or even just in everyday conversations with friends who people just don't understand what it is that women are doing. I think you can see from these pictures that they look just like the pictures I showed you earlier of the men in combat jobs. People don't realize that women are doing these same things already and that women are already serving in these roles. And this lawsuit has given me a platform to speak about that and to help educate the public who very frequently then shares our view that this is not an acceptable way to order the world. There have been definitely some lessons that I've learned that I would like to share with you today. The first is that I didn't go into this seeking to make social change, but it was an opportunity that came up. A lot of times at law school, we're faced with the opportunity of going to a law firm or doing something good for the world. That's not a real choice, right? That's actually a false way of presenting it or looking at the situation. I joined the Marine Corps to lead Marines. I joined the Marine Corps to serve my country and to challenge myself. I got all that. I wasn't trying to start a social movement. I haven't started a social movement. But when I did see something that was wrong, I had an opportunity to say, no, that's not OK. And I was able to bring about change in something that was important to me while doing something that I really loved. And I would encourage you, as you think about your way forward, to think that it's not just one path that can lead to the change that you think that you'd want, like to see in the world. The second uh, lesson that I've learned is definitely related to that, and that it's that there are so many different opportunities to effect change. So it's not just suing the government, which is probably an option most people don't have. Um, but even in my own experience, I mentioned sexual comments and inappropriate uh, remarks, and that was a sort of a standard part of life as a Marine. And it was a standard thing that I put up with. It was something that my Marines put up with. And when someone made an inappropriate comment to me, I'd make an inappropriate comment right back. <laughs> I could handle it. I was tough. I was a Marine just like you, right? Maybe not the best decision. Because when, when some Marine, when my peer said that to me, it wasn't because he was a bad person. He was trying to figure out what the appropriate professional balance was himself. And by responding to that, I let him think that what he said was OK, that it was OK to make those comments and that he could go out and continue treating women like that or continue to have those interactions as he went through his career. If I had said, you know what, I'm not okay with that. That's not how we should speak professionally to each other. That's not how we need to conduct ourselves. I would have had an opportunity to change his view. And when he went forward and when he went and interacted with female Marines and male Marines and homosexual Marines and any other type of Marine, he would have thought twice about the way he was speaking to people and the way he was treating them. That was something, you don't have to have a lawsuit to be able to do that. You just have to be aware of the situations around you and think about what makes you uncomfortable and how you can go about making those changes in daily life. My third lesson, which is something I'm still constantly working to balance, is remembering that while I have to be confident in what I'm doing, I also am not excused from the responsibility of evaluating my actions and think about what I'm doing and critique myself. So when we first filed the lawsuit, I got a hate fax, right? I legitimately didn't know people still used fax machines, but some guy <laughs> pulled his out so he could send me a kind of nasty letter. But, but more challenging than that, frankly, was my friends, the people I had served with, the people who I had gone through training and, and been in Afghanistan with, 
who, who wrote me letters and who wrote me emails and who called me to say that they didn't agree with what I was doing. And they thought that I was actually trying to weaken the Marine Corps. And I was trying to hurt national security when I knew that giving everyone an opportunity to serve based on their abilities was actually going to improve and strengthen the force. So I had to believe in what I was doing because I was facing criticism from my peers. I had a lot of support. I relied on my friends who were supportive. I relied on the, the positive emails you get too, but it's, it's hard to ignore those tough ones. But it can be easy then, once you've sort of blocked that out, to just bathe in the glow of approval, right? And to say, I'm fighting for change. I know that I'm doing the right thing. But really, you have to listen to that criticism, not the facts. You don't have to listen to the guy with the facts. But you do have to listen to the people who really want to engage on the issue and are trying to wrestle through it themselves. One of the common uh, pieces of feedback or concern, one of the uh, common concerns that I hear is people who say, but there really are differences in physical abilities in men and women. And combat is physical, so are women actually going to be able to do it? And that's actually a good point. It is a valid concern. And so now when I talk about this issue, I say, you know what, I'm not trying to just put women in these jobs. We're just trying to give women who can meet the standards the opportunity to serve their country. Just like any man who can meet the standards has the opportunity to serve his country. And people relate to that. They understand. They say that actually lines up with my values as well. And it makes, has made me a more effective advocate. But I do have to remember that sometimes you have to listen to the criticism, sometimes you have to listen to what people are saying, even if you don't like it and it makes you uncomfortable. My final lesson, which I feel like has been particularly sharp for me because I've worked on both the ground level and I'm now working on the legal side, is the, uh, you have to understand the possibility that's available in the law, but also understand the limitations. So as we said, this policy was actually repealed. That's a great start. We hope to get everything done. If we get everything opened up, that would be a huge legal win. The lawsuit would be considered a success. But at that point, the work is by no means done. There's going to be that first woman who comes in as a first Marine infantry officer. There's going to be that first woman riding on a tank. There's going to be that first woman in an artillery unit. And every one of those women is going to be held to a higher standard. She's going to face stricter scrutiny. She's going to be belittled and mocked and assumed that she can't do the job. None of that's going to be fair. But if she doesn't go through that, the next woman who comes behind her won't have it just a little bit easier. And so when you're working on that legal level, you can't lose sight of the fact that you can change the organization from the top, but you're not going to be able to change everything. And there are going to be people who come after you who have to do the really hard work and we're gonna have the tough time. And make sure that when you're working on that legal level, you're setting the ground for them to come in and do their job. So to close, I'd like to tell one story, one last story. As I said, my Marines were spread throughout Helmand Province, and I had several teams up in Sangin District. This was one of the worst districts. It was one of the most dangerous districts probably in all of Afghanistan at the time. The battalion there, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, had had a very brutal deployment. They'd taken a lot of casualties. They'd really done a phenomenal job. But any time as a woman, you're going into that environment for the first time to see how my team was doing, it's always a little uncomfortable. You never know how you're going to be received. Will you be respected because your team and your Marines have made a valuable contribution to the fight? Or are you going to be shunned and looked down on because it's dangerous and women don't belong there? So I sat down with the two senior leaders of the battalion. And they were telling me about the first time that my female Marines had been in a, in a firefight with their Marines. And they could actually see it happening from where they were on the base. And they said, the rounds started coming, and everyone hit the ground, and they sought cover. And then everyone looked for targets. And the people who had targets fired back. Then they maneuvered. They, the appropriate situation in that, the appropriate response in that situation was to come back to the base. And so everyone came back to the base together. And when they were back, they had that combat high, that adrenaline rush, and they were laughing and hugging and generally reveling and being alive. And he said, ma'am, at that point, they weren't just some female Marines who were assigned to support our unit and who we had to accept. They were our sisters. And that meant so much to me because I knew how hard those Marines had worked. I knew how much those women wanted to be there, how important their job was to them. And I could see that that effort had paid off and that women could do this. They would gain acceptance if only people could see the opportunity. I'm proud to be involved in an effort to help remove that bar so that more women can come in and start doing the work on the ground. 
And I can only hope that you here today, whether it's through working through the ground, working at the legal level, or through community service, or just generally being a leader in your job, I hope you all have the opportunity to do something that's as important to you as this is to me. Thank you.